layers of the cake, nature and the community. So, to make our complicated crisis simple, we can reasonably assert that any, possible, any possibility of future sustainability, not to mention justice, must begin by revaluing the whole cake, beginning from the bottom up. Now, these broad ideas are familiar to all of you in this room because you are the pioneers of environmental economists and justice-minded ecologists. You're already exploring their implications. What some of you might, however, find surprising is that the Bible is more of an ally than we imagined in our struggle to reverse the great transformation that Polanyi lamented. As we search for resources to hold the community together in the face of everything pulling it apart, I want to suggest that we don't so much need a new cosmology as much as to recover an older one. And that scripture will be one of our most important tools in rebuilding the consciousness reflected in texts like this, the Exodus tradition of the unhewn stone. What delights God is not our technological intervention but our symbiotic relationship with the creation. Now, so, so that's really what I, I want to focus the rest of my comments on, is how scripture can be a resource for our work. In my popular education work, we emphasize the story of the manna in the wilderness as the foundational text of what we call Sabbath economics. This is not primarily a Sunday school feeding miracle or a morality tale about trust as it's usually taught in our churches and synagogues. Exodus 16 is a didactic story about the importance of following instructions. Here's the deal. The Hebrews have been sprung from Egyptian slavery, but now they must face the harsh realities of life outside the imperial system. The ancient Israelites, like modern North Americans, couldn't imagine an economic system apart from the Egyptian political, military, technological complex, despite the fact that they were at the bottom of that pyramid. And so they famously lament out in the wilderness, would that we had died at the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt as we sat by our flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. Or to paraphrase it, we may have been slaves down yonder, but at least we had three square meals a day at McDonald's. <laughs> but you have led us, Moses, into the desert to die of hunger. This bears the truth of the old African-American proverb, it's easier to get the people out of Egypt than <laughs> Egypt out of the people. The story now turns to illustrate Yahweh's alternative to the Egyptian economic cosmology. Here's the deal, says Yahweh, I will rain bread from heaven. Now this is a very ancient trope. And I'd like to suggest that I believe it symbolizes fertility or fecundity as the essential divine gift. This is a process that begins with rain and sun and soil and ends with bread as the famous line from Isaiah 55 puts it. Rain and snow come down, and they do not return until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. It's all gift. The fact that, as Joshua 5 puts it later, the manna ceased on the day the Israelites ate the produce of the land, shows that the manna is a metaphor for the Earth's natural productivity. The conditions for material sustenance are a gift that the Creator has woven into the creation. But now Exodus 16 wants to argue more than that. It wants to pose this as a test to see if Israel will follow instructions on how to gather 
this gift. The people's first lesson outside of Egypt, in other words, is an economic lesson. Now, it shouldn't come as a surprise that the divine alternative to empire would be to reassert the cosmology of nature's grace. After all, this is the worldview that sustained human life ways for tens of thousands of years prior to the rise of imperial societies. It's the oldest wisdom on the planet. It's still held by indigenous people and campesinos around the globe. It is the worldview that Sister Dorothy Stang lived and died for in the Brazilian rainforest. So what are the instructions in Exodus 16? They define the three characteristics of the economics of grace. Number one, the people are told to gather just enough manna for their needs. In contrast to Israel's Egyptian condition of deprivation, in this vision everyone has enough. Those who gathered more had no surplus. Those who gathered less had no shortage. In God's economy, there is such a thing as too much. And there is such a thing as too little. Needless to say, this contrasts radically with the economic cosmology we know and love. In modern capitalism, there's an infinite tolerance for wealth and an infinite tolerance for poverty. This theology of enough is underlined by the probably later version of the manna story that we find in Numbers 11, in which people's lack of limits is punished with a plague of greed. God struck them with a very great plague, and that place was called Kibroth Hatava, which means the graves of greed. Now there's a metaphor for affluenza. The second instruction in Exodus 16 is that the manna should not be stored up. Wealth and power in Egypt was defined by surplus accumulation. It's no accident that Israel's forced labor consisted of building store cities into which the empire's plunder and the tribute of subject peoples was gathered. This too prefigures capitalism, whose dictum according to Karl Marx was accumulate accumulate, accumulate, that is the law and the prophets. Well, the Bible understands all too well how imperial societies exert centripetal force, drawing labor and resources and wealth into greater and greater concentrations of idolatrous power. The archetypal description of this is found in the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. Such a short distance from the garden to the tower in the story of uh, the primeval narrative of creation. So Exodus 16 enjoys, is, enjoins Israel to keep the wealth circulating through strategies of redistribution, not concentrating through strategies of accumulation. The third instruction introduces for the first time in the biblical narrative the communal discipline of keeping Sabbath. Six days you shall gather, but on the seventh, which is the Sabbath, there will be no gathering. Now we Christians tend to regard Sabbath as, at best, one of the Ten Commandments, and at worst, as a quaint Jewish custom. But this injunction is instituted even before the covenant is handed down at Sinai, and it is reiterated at the conclusion of the covenant code as a life and death issue. In other words, Sabbath is the beginning and end of Torah. Why? Because Sabbath is much more than a prescribed periodic rest for the land and human labor. It is the bedrock of a culture of constraint. Its prohibitions function to disrupt our compulsive attempts to control nature and our addictive need to maximize the forces of production and consumption. As one Hebrew Bible scholar, Richard Lowry, puts it, Sabbath observance requires a leap of faith, a firm confidence that the world will continue to operate benevolently for a day without our help. Imagine that. 